Hi, my name is Sharka and I will be presenting practical pigment mixing for digital painting. Let's start with what pigment mixing is. I think it's safe to say that we all played with paints in elementary school, so we all have this intuition of how colors naturally mix. For example, we know that blue and yellow make green. We also know that sometimes, when paints come out of the tube, they are really dark, sometimes almost black, and we can't tell what color they are until we mix them with a little bit of white and then they reveal beautiful saturated colors. This is real life pigment mixing. And we would probably expect colors in painting software to behave the same way. Something like this, right? Well, they don't. None of the widely used professional painting software mixes colors naturally. If we look at Photoshop, which is a favorite tool of many professional artists, blue and yellow make gray, or this brownish gray. And dark colors mixed with white are desaturated, not radiant, like the colors that pop up in real life. Same goes for Procreate, the most popular painting software for iPads. Same for Krita, the leading open source painting program. Same for Rebel, that has state-of-the-art watercolors and oils. And this is where it gets really frustrating, because you work with this beautifully simulated media, but the colors don't behave like you would expect them to. Same for Adobe Fresco and Coral Painter. None of these professional software provide intuitive paint-like color mixing. So what do they do? They all treat color as light and mix it additively in RGB. If you mix pure digital blue and yellow additively, you make a linear average of them, you really do get gray. And that is fine. In real life, if you have blue and yellow torches and you shine them on a white wall, you also get gray. It's correct. But that's not how paints behave, obviously. And if you're making a painting software, why don't you treat colors as paints? Is it possible that we don't know how to do it? Well, no. We know exactly how pigment mixing works, and we've known that for almost a century now, thanks to the research of Pavel Kubelka and Franz Munch. They were the first to predict the behavior of pigment mixtures, and there must be a reason why nobody in the digital painting industry ever picked it up. So let's look into it a little bit. How does pigment mixing work? How do we get that green from blue and yellow? Suppose we have one gray of pigment and we shine some light on it. Now, some of the light gets scattered and some of it gets inside where it is partially absorbed and the rest gets through and bounces off the background. Now, the amount of scattered and absorbed light determine the color of this pigment grain. Absorption and scatter, these two things are important. When we have a layer of pigment grains, like a paint blob, and light enters it, it is repeatedly scattered and absorbed and transmitted, and it bounces around for a while before it gets out and reaches our eyes. And that's when we see the color of this paint blob. And we're familiar with this phenomena, it's subsurface scattering. The green from blue and yellow arises during this subsurface scattering. Blue and yellow pigments have different scattering and absorbing properties. Blue absorbs long wavelengths uh, and yellow absorbs short ones. And the wavelengths that survive this double absorption are green. Green is what's left from white light after it passed through blue and yellow pigment grains. But how do we simulate this? Subsurface scattering is a chaos and in rendering we simulate it with path tracing, but that's not practical for digital painting. So luckily, thanks to Kubelka and Munch, we have a closed form solution to all this. This is the diffuse reflectance formula. It outputs a reflectance spectrum of a pigment, uh, which is the result of the subsurface scattering. Now this part of the equation represents the subsurface scattering, and the input is the ratio between absorption and scatter, the K and S coefficients in the formula. Um, scatter and absorption are functions of wavelength, and measuring them is not trivial, but it can be done. So, what if we want to mix two colors together? <clears throat> we take the concentration of each of the pigments and make a linear combination of their absorption and scattering coefficients. That way we get absorption and scatter of the final mixture, and we run it through the Kubelka-Mung formula. As a result, we get this reflectance spectrum of the mixture and we shine an illumination light on it and then we can convert it to RGB and display it on screen. 
Now let's have a look at the difference between Kubelka Munk and linear additive mixing. Mixing blue and yellow by doing a linear combination of them, like it's done in Photoshop, creates a straight line that pierces through the grayscale diagonal in the middle. But subsurface scattering is a highly nonlinear process, and so is the Kubelka Munk formula. Um, and thanks to this nonlinearity, the trajectory between blue and yellow bends away from the grayscale and it passes through this beautiful green. So this is what happens in real life, and this is what we want in digital painting. And the research on how to actually implement or integrate Kubelka Munk into digital painting has been done. Let's mention Hasse and Mayer, who introduced pigment mixing into computer graphics in the early 90s. And then William Baxter, who did seminal research on simulating oils and acrylic paints. Strangely enough, it has never been picked up by graphic software outside research, and even three decades since the publication of Haas and Mayer, blue and yellow make grey in painting software. Why? We talked about this with the developers of Rebel, who actually brought this issue to our attention, and it turns out that implementing Kubelka Munk is simply impractical. Let's see why. In order to perform Kubelka Munk, we need the absorption and scatter coefficients, right? So what Hasse and Mayer proposed was to track these coefficients in each pixel. Now, they are the functions of wavelength, and you should have at least 36 samples per each, which means that you would have to represent the canvas with 72 channels, 36 times 2. So that's inefficient. And Baxter proposed something um, a lot better, Instead of tracking KNS in each pixel, we pick a palette of favorite pigments that we want to paint with, and we only track the concentrations. Now, if you pick, let's say, eight pigments to paint with, you'd still have to represent the canvas with eight channels. But every painting software is built around the three-channel RGB representation. And leaving RGB behind and changing the core structure of the of the software to upscale from three channels to eight or seven to two is a requirement nobody seems to be willing to follow. On top of that, working with Kubelka Munk means limiting the color gamut only to colors that can be mixed from pigments. And some RGB colors can be mixed from any real pigments. That means that we cannot use the RGB picker that everybody is used to. Uh, and it also means that we can't even load photographs and work with them. These are the reasons why nobody implemented natural color mixing in digital painting yet. We need to make it more practical so that any existing painting software can just easily plug it in, which means that we have to make Kubelka and Munk work as a black box. And this black box needs to take RGB inputs and produce RGB outputs. This way, implementing natural mixing into any painting software would be as easy as replacing every mix linear function calling with mix natural, because they have the same parameters. This, so this is what we did. We packaged Kubelka Munk pigment mixing into the RGB in, RGB out black box, and we call it Mixbox. So how does Mixbox work? We choose a palette of four primary pigments and we measure their absorption and scatter coefficients. We picked Hansa yellow, Taylor blue, quinacridon magenta, and titanium white, because they produce the largest color gamut. But these can be picked differently based on personal preferences. We need these primary pigments because the RGB colors will be internally mixed from them. So how do we mix multiple, in this case four, pigments using Kubelka Munk? Well, we need to know how much of each pigment will be used. So we need four concentrations, and they are the numbers from 0 to 1, and they have to sum up to 1. We use them to make linear combination of the four pigments absorption and scatter coefficients. That way we get absorption and scatter of the final mixture, and we run it through the Kubelka Munk formula, and the result is a reflectance spectrum of the mixture. To obtain the final color that we can display on screen, we multiply the reflectance spectrum with an illumination spectrum and we convert it to RGB. And there it is. This is the mix function that we'll be using in our mix box. Now let's have a look at the mix box scheme. The input consists of two RGB colors and a mixing ratio T. We take the two incoming colors 
and apply the inverse to the mixing function you saw on a previous slide <clears throat> in order to get the corresponding pigment concentrations. Now, since this is an inverse to mix, we call it the unmix. So now we have two vectors of concentrations and we make a linear interpolation of them using the mixing ratio T. As a result, we get a vector of concentrations of the final mixture. We now apply the mix function and get the RGB values of the finally naturally mixed result. This is the general idea, so uh, let's get to, to some obstacles. Obviously, the primary pigments give us a limited gamut, and there are RGB colors that cannot be mixed from any pigments. So this is our first problem. How do we cover the whole RGB gamut? Colors like this, pure digital blue and yellow, can only be made by shining light. There are no concentrations that would mix real pigments into these digital colors. So what we do is that we find the closest possible colors that can be mixed from pigments, and we use Kudelka Mung to mix them naturally, and we obtain a temporary um, RGB result. Now, let's have a closer look at the projected colors. As you can see, the projected colors need to shine more or less light to exactly match the target color. So we started the RGB difference between projected and target colors. This residual term represents the missing part of red, green, and blue light that needs to be added to the projected color to match the target. And since it essentially represents light, we can now mix it linearly and simply add it to the temporary RGB, and we get the final result. So this is how we solved it. And thanks to this light correction, we can now mix all RGB colors together, even those that can be mixed from pigments. So we cover the whole RGB gamut, uh, and now we can use these uh, wheel picker, we can paint with whatever color we want, we can load photographs and work with them, um, and it's all, it's all good, it seems like it's done, right? We thought so too, but it isn't. There is another problem, maybe a little less obvious, but a very critical one. Remember that in order for all this to work, the unmix and mix function must be invertible. And at this point, we can guarantee that they are. Now let's see why. Earlier I said that we picked the particular pigments because they produce the largest gamut. Well, it turns out that the gamut is even bigger than the RGB cube at some places. <clears throat> so just like we have RGB colors that cannot be mixed from any real-life pigments, we also have paint mixtures that are so saturated that no screen can display them. And the easiest way to ensure that we have a valid RGB output, meaning that it ranges from 0 to 255, is to clamp the overflowing values, right? But if we do that, we lose important information. Suppose that we have three different sets of concentrations, and they would mix into three different RGB colors. If we clamp the result, these three distinctive colors will collapse to one. And now we have multiple sets of concentrations that mix into the same color. Now, this is a critical moment because it means that if we use clamping, the mix function is not invertible. We've lost information about where in space we were. So forget clamping, we need to do something else. To solve this, we went right to the source, the pigments, because it's their KNS coefficients that cause these trajectories to exceed the RGB border. So we posed this as an optimization task and we produced new KNS coefficients for each of our pigments. We call them surrogate pigments, and when we mix them, they follow the original pigment's trajectories as closely as possible without exceeding the RGB borders. And now, here is the comparison of the two gamuts and the original versus surrogate pigments. It's important to realize that the color of the pigment itself doesn't really matter that much, because even two manufacturers would probably produce two different thalo blues or quinacridone magentas. What is important is how these pigments behave when we mix them with other colors, which is here. For example, we expect thalo blue to make a turquoise gradient when mixed with white, or to make a radiant green when mixed with yellow. 
These gradients are important. These trajectories between pigment pairs are the ones that we try to match when optimizing the new surrogate pigments. And as you can see, even though that the endpoint pigment colors may be a little different, what really matters is that we preserve the behavior predicted by Kubelka Mung, which means that we preserved and we still produce natural color mixing. So by using these surrogate pigments, we get a natural pigment gamut that doesn't exceed the RGBQ borders, which means that we don't apply any clipping, and that means that we get rid of any ambiguities. So now the mix and unmix functions are fully invertible, and our mixing model can be used in real digital painting. This is the first time that the Kubelka Munk mixing model has been performed purely on RGB. So let's have a look at the results. Here you can see that unlike RGB mixing, we reproduce the colors that pop up in real life. Getting natural green from blue and yellow is the basis, but thanks to the Kubelka Munk model packed inside our mix box, we also reproduce the hue shifts and saturation gains when paints mix with white, but also with other colors. Notice how the orange and purple that we produce is so much more vivid than the orange and purple from RGB mixing. Uh, also, brown color from blue and red is another secondary color that you can get from linear mixing. And we do. And here we have some examples from Rebel to see how natural color mixing enhances simulated media. This is the same RGB color, by the way. Uh, but a thinner layer of dark blue in RGB is just desaturated, so the brush stroke on the left looks dull. In real life, a thin layer of dark blue pigment, like Thalo Blue, is saturated turquoise, and you can feel the difference from the first brush stroke. It just feels more real, and this finally looks like, um, like oil is on canvas. The watercolors are all about repetitive mixing and layering, so this is a significant step up that the colors actually cooperate and produce beautiful secondary colors without losing saturation. Now, with this mixing model, you could actually do Bob Ross tutorials in a painting software and follow him each step of the way, and the colors on your screen would actually do the same thing as his colors on the canvas. And this was my attempt to do it, but we also had a professional painter try out Rebel with our mixing model, and this was his result. So I would like to end this presentation with this beautiful piece of art. And just a final note, we have released our source code so you can download it and try it out if you want to. Maybe give us feedback, we'd be happy to hear from any of you. Thank you very much for your attention. Goodbye.